Hi everyone, Jeff Spira here again, and I've got another Voyages uh, video to show you today. And this one is from uh, from 1876 and uh, out of Gloucester, Massachusetts, and it's about a man named Alfred Johnson. So, uh, Alfred Johnson was born in Denmark in December 4th, 1846. So, you know, Denmark is a peninsula uh, and a series of islands between Sweden and Germany. In, you know, in the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, it kind of separates the two. It's a very nautical location there. Um, it was a home of the Vikings at one time, so uh, they have a very extensive seagoing history and culture. Uh, I've been to I've been to uh, uh, Denmark and uh, in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and and they have a very famous port there with a harbor and and uh, you know they've been they've been seagoing folk for a long time. But uh, Johnson, uh, when he was he grew up there and he ran away to sea as uh, a teenager, and at the time they were square rigger ships there, you know. Um, that hauled, transported goods all over Europe and, you know, North America and uh, South America and, you know, all over the world, really. But they, they, uh, they spent a lot of time going back and forth between North America and, and Europe. So. Um, so at the time when you were a sailor there, you could, you could jump ship when you, when you arrived at a port and spend some time where you, where you were. And then, uh, get on another ship as they're leaving so they they uh there was plenty of there was plenty of moving around between ships between uh for the merchant seamen at the time and uh um some sometimes they would sail for years you know long periods of time so that there wasn't much chance to get off you didn't want to get off in a you know small island anywhere you wanted to get off somewhere where you could where you could catch another ship going a different direction you know when we when you got there but um, anyway, Johnson uh, sailed on these ships, and he ended up in uh, Gloucester, or Gloucester, I guess, <laughs> Massachusetts, and uh, ended up getting off the ship, and he thought he'd try his hand at fishing. Um, back then, they used schooners to go out to the fishing grounds, which were, you know, quite a ways offshore. They would go out for two or three months. Um, and so he was a dory man. They would drop dories in the water and then they would uh, hand line for fish with, uh, you know, fishing lines and, and uh, hooks and bait and, the, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and he became quite a halibut fisherman. Um, and this was, uh, you know, dory fishing at the time was, was uh, very popular in that area. It was, uh, um, you know, you may have heard of salt cod, for instance, which was a which was they were a lot of codfish caught and then they were salted and put into into um, uh, hogshead barrels and then shipped all over the world and uh, they, they would preserve the fish very well and all that so um, you know there's been a number of movies made about the, the dorymen and the schooners back then and uh, one of the great ones was based on an 1897 novel written by Rudyard Kipling and it's called Captain's Courageous. Um, they made three movies like that. Um, the first one was that I r remember seeing. That, uh, there may be more. I I'm not sure, but was uh, made in 1937, and it, and it featured uh, um, uh, Spencer Tracy as the captain, and uh, he actually won an Oscar uh, for that movie. Um, and it was, uh, I used to see it when I was a kid. They would show old black and white movies on TV, you know, all the time. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, I, I remember seeing it back then, and I've seen it again since, uh, you know, when you could rent, rent old movies again, too. So um, Another one was made in 1977, and it starred Carl Malden uh, as the captain. Uh, he was from the streets of San Francisco. I don't know, that was a, that was a, big TV show back in the, in my, you know, teen and, and 20s era, you know, so. And there was a third one made uh, starring Robert Urich as the captain. And he was, he was, uh, you know, played a Las Vegas guy in a, in a, a movies on TV. But this was made in 1997. And it was also a good one, too. And I think the, um, 
the original Spencer Tracy one was the best one, though. And it captures the Doryman's life in the 1800s pretty well, I think. So, Well, um, Alfred Johnson was working out of Gloucester as a fisherman. He worked maybe seven years at it or so. And then um, it, the year turned 1876. And that was a big year in the United States. Uh, it was the 100th anniversary of the founding from 1776. And I was, a, I remember the, the uh, 1976, the bicentennial year, but this was the first centennial. So um, there was a lot of parties and, and uh, all kinds of things. So. so in the spring of 1876, Alfred Johnson was in a bar drinking with his buddies, you know, and playing cards, they say. Um, one would assume they were other Gloucester fishermen because that's, <laughs> that's who hung out in, in bars and played cards <laughs> at that time. And uh, they, they got talking about the possibility of crossing the Atlantic alone from Massachusetts back to England. And, um, you know, they, they got into all kinds of arguments about whether it would be possible or not. And, and finally, Alfred Johnson said, not only is it possible, but I'm going to do it. Everybody kind of was taken aback, and he said, yep, I'm, I'm going to do it. So he took, uh, he spent about $200, and he, and he uh, um, had a dory built and, uh, and, and provisioned with it. And uh, it was a wooden 20-foot-on-deck uh, dory. It was uh, 16 feet uh, along the bottom. Along the, they called it along the keel, but uh, five and a half feet wide and two two and a half feet tall. So... And it also had a centerboard. It, it, a lot of dories were sailed back then, but they rarely had centerboards. They would just use the natural shape of the dory and keep them, keep them in the right direction. So, But he had his dory built with oak frames, and uh, and he had very well fastened to handle open water of the ocean. So, And he dubbed the boat the Centennial, uh, having to do with the 100-year anniversary of the U.S. So, so he also had a, a canvas sail, um, two jibs. They also had a square sail that he could set up for downwind. Um, he had, of course, charts and a compass and a quadrant, which was the version of the sextant back then. Um, he had medicine with him and a sea anchor for holding the uh, bow into the wind uh, when, when it was, uh, you know, that's, that's a good idea to have when, when you're uh, crossing in a, in a small boat. So He packed uh, canned meats, condensed milk, fruit, hard bread, tea, and coffee. He had 60 gallons of water with him. And uh, he, he, could, he could rig an awning to catch rainwater uh, to replenish his supply if, if need be. So. so he planned to follow this course from uh, Liverpool, I mean to Liverpool, from Gloucester, um, but the one, same one that the ocean steamers made and the, and the square riggers. It was about a 3,000 mile crossing and he wanted to do it in less than 90 days. So he bragged about his upcoming journey, and so they, there was a big crowd waiting for him when uh, when he uh, uh, was ready to sail. And uh, they they you know then the press was there as well, you know the newspapers and stuff. And uh, um, at uh, four fifteen p.m. on June fifteenth, eighteen seventy six, um, he sailed from the Gloucester wharves. Uh, from the Higgins and Gifford Wharf, which is now called Parker Street Wharf, um, into the ocean. So uh, his first stop was in Nova Scotia, uh, but he, he decided he needed to make a few adjustments and all that. So he stopped in Nova Scotia. And then um, and on the 25th, uh, he sailed back into the open uh, North Atlantic. So um, and... Uh, uh, Anyway, the, the, he saw a lot of ships along the way. You know, of course, he was he was using a a, a, a common trade route. Uh, so, um, you know, and a lot of ships tried to stop and rescue him. They figured one guy in a in a small boat that far out to sea must be must be, uh, you know, <laughs> needing needing rescue. So, um, a German passenger ship uh, uh, even threw him some bottles of brandy, which of course he accepted, but he. Uh, he he refused, politely refused the rescues and said, no, he could take care of himself. So um, he sailed about 70 miles a day, which is 110 kilometers, which was respectable for a small boat in the open sea. 
And uh, eventually, as he got, uh, you know, most of the way across, he ran into a, a major gale, uh, which actually capsized the boat, put him in the water. He was in the water for about 20 minutes, and uh, but he managed to get the boat back upright and uh, bailed out and crawled back into it and dried out and all that. So um, he spotted land on August 12th, and he landed in Abercastle, Wales. Um, and to, uh, was his first landing after Nova Scotia. So he was there for three days and then he, uh, he, he, you know, cause he was tired and he was beat <laughs> after a long journey there. And then he headed back to sea to head uh, to Liverpool, which was he, where he was originally intending to go. So on August 21st, he arrived to a big cheering crowd in Liverpool and, and the press was there and, uh, and uh, everybody was cheering and he had uh, big parties and celebrations and all that because he made it. He made it across the ocean. Uh, he received some attention from his feet and his boat was exhibited in Liverpool for several months. And he was named after that uh, Alfred Centennial Johnson. So uh, eventually he headed back to Gloucester on a passenger ship uh, to return to his fishing days. So. So his voyage was the first recorded single-handed crossing of the, of the Atlantic, and perhaps the first major single-handed passage carried out in the spirit of adventure. He, there were no one, no one did that then, um, and it wasn't until um, I, I don't know another 25 years when uh, when Josh Slocum would would sail out for his round the world uh, crossing, which I, I'm also going to create a video for eventually. Anyway, when he was last asked, when he was late in life, Alfred Johnson said, why, why did you make that trip? And he said, I made that trip because I was a damn fool, just as they said I was. <laughs> so uh, Johnson's dory uh, was also returned from Liverpool, and it now rests at the Cape Ann Maritime Museum. Um, they had it outdoors, uh, and, and there's a picture of it in the 1920s. Um, but today it's, it's actually brought indoors and it's, uh, it's still on display, the centennial itself. So there's also a plaque at the museum, uh, commemorating his voyage. And there's another plaque, uh, on display in Abercrombie, Wales, Abercrombie, I guess that's it. And it talks about his voyage. So, uh, uh, Alfred Johnson passed away in 1927 at the age of 81 years. Now, I'm in the process of designing a 20-foot sailing dory um, built just like the Johnson's, really ultra beefy for offshore use and having a seaworthy sail rig. So I'm planning on calling it the Centennial 2. So if you keep posted on my website and social media, I'll make an announcement when it's complete and available and ready to sell. So um, anyway, be sure and like, share, and subscribe to my channel, and be sure to stop by my website if you get the chance as well, and join up um, with me on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook uh, under the name Spira Boats. I'm in all three of those, and um, thank you for watching, and uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you again soon.